appreciate it. But welcome, everyone, um, to another episode of Live Nation Urban Presents, The Souls of Black Folk. I'm your host, Brandon Pankey. And today we have a super, super, super special guest. This is Dr. Cameron Webb. And Dr. Webb is Director of Health Policy and Equity at University of Virginia's School of Medicine. Dr. Webb, thank you for having me. Thank you for being here, man. No, my pleasure for, for being here. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. Now, can I call you Cameron? Before we kick off, I want to make sure. Yeah, let's, 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 let's cut it down to Cam. It works just fine for me. <laughs> All good. All good. So I want to, before we kick off, I want to give you, you know, your props and a congratulations. A couple of weeks ago, uh, Cameron won uh, Virginia's fifth congressional district Democratic primary race. Um, so super congrats on that, man. I have a lot of family in Virginia. Um, it's a small town. I only like telling people in public what town it is, but small town of Virginia, they're all going to be voting for you, man. So congratulations and good luck um, in the general election in November. Thank you so much. It was exciting. It was an exciting kind of process to get to the primary. And I think that primary election, it went, you know, as, as well as we could have hoped for. So we're excited, uh, kind of really uniting the district and moving forward. So, uh, so we like our prospects for November, but um, I just feel blessed. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, you know, kind of getting into that, if you can, let me know your history, how you got to be where you're at. I mean, there are some key points that are going to dovetail into our conversation, which goes into healthcare disparities for Black Americans. And part of your history is working with President Obama in the White House and the work you've done there. So I just want to, you know, talk about your history leading to where you are now uh, before we kick off the conversation. Yeah, I mean, the long and short of it, I'm a kid from Central Virginia from Spotsylvania County. So talk about, uh, you know, smaller towns, but, uh, but from Spots, you grew up and, uh, and then went to college at the University of Virginia. That's where, uh, you know, I, I really found my passion for, for a lot of things. You know, I, I guess to start, you know, I wanted to be a doctor since I was five years old. I, I met a, there was an African-American doctor who, uh, who was taking care of my, my siblings and I, who was our primary care doctor. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was just powerful, like seeing a black man in a white coat and, and seeing him serving our community the way that he was, I said, I want to serve my community that way too. And so that, that's when the, the spark was lit and I knew I wanted to be a doctor. And then from there, I got to college at the University of Virginia and, mm -hmm. um, and I, I was pre-med, ready to do it. And the first class I took, I learned about all the disparities in healthcare, the, dispar you know, the differences in, in outcomes with diabetes or high blood pressure or heart disease and strokes or HIV AIDS or immunizations or infant mortality. And you just see that, you know, in condition after condition, you know, black folks were suffering. And it struck me as a social justice issue, as a civil rights issue in so many ways. And I said, well, how do we fight for justice? And that's where, you know, I really looked to the law as a tool to fight for justice. And that's what the idea came together to both pursue my medical and law degrees at the same time. That idea that, you know, hey, there's, there's some synergy here between, you know, being a healer and fighting for justice at the same time. And I wanted to put those skill sets together. So I did, uh, I did med school down in North Carolina at Wake Forest. And then after my third year of med school, went off to Chicago to do law school for three years. Mm -hmm. came, came back from my last year of med school, then did my residency training in internal medicine. So that's kind of the, the training portion. I finished all that and I said, well, what do I do with this? And, and uh, you know, I admired President Obama deeply. And I, I said, if I have a chance to work in that administration, I'm going to go for it. So I shot my shot and, uh, and uh, was selected for the White House Fellowship, was placed in the executive office of the president, worked with President Obama. And that gave me a chance to work on health care issues and also on his My Brother's Keeper initiative. So again, health and social justice at the same time, which was really powerful, really exciting. And, uh, and then I landed from there here back home, Central Virginia, at the, U at the University of Virginia on faculty, doing work on health and social justice and the teaching, research, and then seeing patients. It was kind of a great combination of things. And, um, and even with that, still seeing that the patients are suffering disproportionately, folks who look like me are suffering. And so I, that's where the idea to run for Congress came in. It was just like, hey, well, there are policies upstream of this that are causing the problem. So that is literally the quickest I've ever done that, Brandon. I have never told that full story that fast, but I did it for you. <laughs> oh, thank you, man. I appreciate it. I'm humbled. I'm humbled by it. So let's dive in, man. I, you know, I don't want to take too much of your time. But there was a report that I read, and I'm going to read a portion of it. And it was from the Century Foundation, and it focused on racism, inequality, and health care for African Americans. And here's the portion I want to read. Even with improved access to medical care under the Affordable Care Act, the disparities in health outcomes between African-Americans and whites are stark. African-American women are three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women. 
The African-American infant mortality rate is twice the rate for white infants. African-Americans are more likely to die from cancer and heart disease than whites and are at greater risk for the onset of diabetes. Across many chronic illnesses, African-Americans are still more likely to die compared to other racial and ethnic groups. Based on everything you know, based on the work that you've done, why? My biggest question has been, why are there such big gaps? Why are there such big disparities between Black Americans in healthcare and other ethnic groups in this country? Yeah, it's racism. Bottom line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to, you know, be so curt about it, but that's just, that's just the reason. And if you look at it, um, we'll start with, with maternal mortality, right? We'll talk about the fact that you have uh, black women who are you know, four times as likely to lose their life after after having a child, and you you ask, well, why? And that's when you control for for income. That's when you control for education. Even after taking care of those things, black women are still more likely to die. And then you factor in things like the effect of chronic stress. And you think of there are lots of forms of chronic stress. Of course, financial stresses or chronic stresses, family stresses. But race-based discrimination is a unique kind of chronic stress or racism, that's what we'll call it, right? That's a unique kind of chronic stressor. And what that stressor does is it actually impacts our physiology. You know, if you're constantly having that, that fight or flight response, where I've done, not just the fight or flight response, but it's this concept called allostatic load. So homeostasis, that's your body at equilibrium. Right. Allostasis is how, when your body is thrown off, when you have a stressor, how you get back to equilibrium. And if your body is constantly trying to make it back to equilibrium after some kind of racist incident, you're in this constant state of trying to come back to, to normal, come back to homeostasis. Now, when that happens, and, and they've done studies to look at allostatic load in different groups, and black women have the highest allostatic load of anybody. If you look at the, the combination of factors, that means that there are constant stressors. Um, some of that is, is just from, is discrimination. Some of it is the intersectionality of race and gender. Some of it is the, the crisis of mass incarceration, removing black men from households and from communities, placing an additional burden on black women. But when you add all those things together, then you start to see how this all manifests. Now this allostatic load theory it also explains to you, yes, you have higher blood pressure in the setting of higher allostatic load. You have more diabetes because cortisol is one of the things released to get you back to that, that normal state, right? So you have more diabetes, you have more heart disease, you have more strokes, you have so many, and, and it doesn't explain everything, but it does explain a lot. The burden of, of chronic stress on Black Americans is significant, and we know that plays a role. The other thing is, remember, you know, there's, there's emerging science in this space. And we talk, there's something called epigenetics. The fact that your genes are your genes, they're one thing, but they are impacted by your environment, the expression of your genes. And that can even be passed on intergenerationally. So sometimes, you know, our, our you know, black and brown babies are born into this society carrying the burden of systemic inequality already imprinted upon their genes, right? And it's not because there's anything defective about the genes. It's about the fact that you put people in stressful environments that even in the womb, that stress has its impact. And so I think those are all things that we just need to, we need to acknowledge and we need to say, hey, how do we address that? There's no quick fix for racism, right? right. But one of the starting points is we just have to talk about it. We have to name it and we have to acknowledge the way it's ravaged our society. People don't like to talk about it. You know, right. But I think that that's the moment that we're in, if, if it tells us nothing else, it tells us how critical that is. And so when I look at the range of health disparities, I can, I can walk you through how racism plays a role in shaping it. Uh, you know, it, and, and that's not the only reason. But if you look mm -hmm. at COVID-19, the role of racism, and remember, I'm talking about racism at multiple levels. So you can talk about that individualized racism, like bias and stereotyping. You can talk about that institutionalized racism, like our criminal justice system, our education systems that feed inequality. Or you can talk about internalized racism. You know, that's that idea the white man's ice is colder, that idea that, you know, there's, there's something about blackness that's inferior to other, to other groups. When you put those things together, you layer those on top of one another, the stress is significant. So I think that plays a huge role in creating our disparities. It's not the only thing. Yeah. It plays a huge role. And then, you know, branch out, think more broadly, uh, systemic inequality in education, in food access, in housing, uh, in transportation, in income inequality. You put all those things together. How do you not expect that we have huge disparities yeah. 
when health happens in those policy areas. And you just touched on it. I was really thinking about those social factors, having economic disadvantages, lack of access to health care centers. Like, talk about that, the lack of access. Why is it that if I live in a certain neighborhood, I don't have the same type of access that I have, you know, if I live in a better, let's call it a more economically feasible neighborhood or, or somewhere, I guess, quote unquote, better to live in. I mean, it's, it's, it's really ridiculous, Cameron, like how... Mm -hmm you know, these disparities kind of play out on a day-to-day -day basis based on everything you just talked about, you know, systemic racism, institutional racism, and how we have to live with that on a day-to-day -day basis. Right. And, and the thing to keep in mind is that we can acknowledge that one of the root causes of the disparity, of the disproportionality, is mm -hmm. racism. We can acknowledge that that's a part of the very design of our communities. We can acknowledge that there's a slave health deficit for as long, for 401 years that we've been in on this continent. We can acknowledge all those things and it still doesn't solve the crisis of, well, what do we do about it today? How do we fix it right now when people are actively dying? So when you talk about access to care, I think that's one of our huge opportunities, right? We need equalizers. We need everybody having access to, to care, universal health coverage. That's something that has to happen. And you know what, what is important distinction to make is that, that if you look across the world, internationally, we achieve universal health coverage in other countries in a multitude of ways. Sometimes it's a single payer system. Sometimes it's a combination of public and private. Accomplishing the goal means that 100% of people have coverage and that's what we need to accomplish, right? So it, it tells you we've got more tools in our belt than we know, but it has to be equitable. It has to be fair. It can't cause financial harm to individuals along the way. You were asking why access is such a problem, you know, why we're having such challenges with folks getting the care that they need. Well, sometimes it's the incentives. Our healthcare system is laden with, it's just, filled with perverse incentives. You know, this idea that if you do more things, you get paid more money. This idea that there are certain types of patients who from a risk profile standpoint are the good patients, the patients you want to take on. There are certain types of insurance that are going to allow you as a health system to have the margin that you need to be a profitable and successful health system, right? And so if you have the wrong payer mix, as we call it, then it's going to really make it hard for you to, to expand your facility, to build your market share, to have new, to have new, uh, you know, new uh, aspects to your facility, you know. Um, and so I think all those things are so important for us to keep in mind. Our, our system is designed with a lot of perverse incentives in mind. And so when we talk about redesigning American healthcare, we do have to talk about it in an equitable way. And we say, even down to the incentives, to what a job well done looks like, it doesn't look like you did more. It looks like you provided a quality of care as efficiently as possible. And that's how you get paid in our system. And those models, we're developing them, we're, we're propagating them sometimes through private insurance, sometimes through Medicare, but we just need more of that. We need all providers to know that, hey, this comes down to uh, what the incentives are and how we can incentivize taking care of all communities. And that's gonna be an important thing. And so you touched on it, but I mean, again, what are those next steps? How do we get to that, that, that place of equitable, universal healthcare and, and really making sure that everyone has equal access to, to having the best quality uh, health care in this country? Well, you know, I'm, I'm running for Congress. There are 435 seats in, in the House of Representatives. There's 100 more in the Senate. If you ask, you know, those 535 individuals, you probably get north of 500 different answers, right? There are a lot of different ways to do this. I think from my standpoint, I realized that the political pendulum, it swings really far and really fast. People don't wait for strategic planning in the United States to decide right. whether something's moving in the right direction or not. And so when we talk about the very next steps, we have to complete this goal of getting everybody covered. We still have north of 30 million folks who aren't covered, who just don't flat out don't have health insurance. And so <laughs> we solved that problem. And to me, I think we solved that problem by creating a public health insurance option that everybody has access to, right? And I, and I think, Cameron, you froze a little. For a second, froze a little bit after. Um, yeah, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So my 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 phone is telling me it's about to die, so I need to plug it in. But um, but but I think you know what we found is that you know for a lot of people, um, you know, you'll hear the argument that yeah, sure, it's 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 great, but that's an incremental step. Why not just cover everybody all at once? And my thing is, there are competing values that people think are the most important values in healthcare. Some Americans feel like the most important value is access and everybody having it. Other people think the most important value is choice. And even though that idea of choice sometimes is a false choice, 
it's hard to convince people that you don't actually have a choice when they think that they do. And so what we have to do is we have to design our next steps to acknowledge that, hey, some people want to lean into choice and some people want to lean into access. And we can accomplish both by using the combination of public and private. That's what happens in Germany, which has universal health coverage. That's what happens in lots of European nations. And so it's important for us to say, hey, there are lots of models, lots of ways to do this. I like that idea because as a next step, it means that we can get 30 million plus people covered soon, right? And we can get that done immediately. And then we allow, if we design that right, we allow people to vote with their feet. They decide. And I also think that, you know, there's a couple other things. I think we should break the bond between employment and health insurance, because I think then it allows people to have that flexibility and say, hey, I choose this public plan or I choose this private plan and my employer may make a defined contribution. That's a different thing. I also believe that public or the private health insurance should be a nonprofit endeavor. Right, because I think that that helps realign those incentives. Instead of making a profit off of my premiums, what you're doing is you're trying to deliver the best care possible, keep me healthy, keep me well. It realigns those incentives. And the last piece is I think we need that that change from fee for service to kind of a more value based model. If we do those things, what we do is we have to be really careful to protect against the risk of creating a two tiered healthcare system. Right, because we can't be creating new inequities along the way. We have to be focused on rooting out inequity. And that starts with everybody having access that moves to making sure that access is to products. One thing people need to keep in mind is we have the financing of healthcare and the delivery system. And even when you talk about a single payer healthcare system, um, that financing, it may be through a single you know, financer, the government paying for everything, but they're paying private uh, hospitals private providers and public providers. And so when your delivery system isn't all a public entity, you still have that risk of folks saying, well, who has access to the private facilities? Who has access to the public facilities? We have to design this eyes wide open and say, what's the risk of creating inequity along the way? And I think that's why we have to be thoughtful. We have to be iterative because 330 million people, we can't get this wrong. There's, my patients, their lives are on the line. So I think for me, I'm, I'm probably a little more cautious than some because I know what's at, what's at stake for every individual. And I know that we just have to get it right along the way. But I think that even that being said, the most important thing to me is equity. It's about everybody in this country having access to the care that they need. And then this may seem like a silly question, but do you think it's realistic for everyone to have that equity? Is that something, you know, within yeah. the next four to, to six, seven years, I can say, hey, you know what? We were able to make enough change where everyone has that opportunity and that access um, to have the best quality health care? I think that it's realistic to achieve universal health coverage within the next you know, four to eight years. I think that just by, by the, from the sheer perspective of, yes, 100% of people in these United States have a card that they can get, they, where they can get care. Um, and that 100% of folks, you know, the accessing of that care doesn't cause financial harm. I think we can accomplish those things. Um, one thing that I, that I always teach my students when we're talking about health care, uh, man, there are so many industries involved. It's one of those things where nature finds a way, right? And so along the way, we're going to see new problems that are created, and we're going to have to root those out too. And that's one of the one of the arguments folks make for a single payer system is they're just like, let's just you know change the whole thing, root and stem, switch it up, and then design from from the beginning. That is one, of it, and I think I understand why people feel that that draw to that idea. I think the challenge is that you know if that doesn't go well. The ACA took four years to even get off the ground. So if it's, if it's not moving in the right direction and we have a new president four years later, then what, right? I always talk about well, what, I worked in the Trump White House for six months as part of my White House fellowship. It was rough. And mm -hmm. I'm like, what would it have been like if Donald Trump had control of the entire American healthcare system? You saw what he did with COVID, right? And so for me, I'm just like, how do we design this so that it is very resilient to the whims of politicians, very resilient in something that really always provides the best care, always provides access. So I do think it's gonna be something that takes time. Um, but I, I think that the, the fight, we always have to be pressing toward justice. We have to keep our eyes really open about what that looks like. There has to be a tremendous amount of transparency. Every community has to be served. We have to be marshalling resources to places that have been historically under-resourced so that they are getting that, that amount of equity, right? But, um, but I think it's, you know, using our data, I'm a researcher, right? So using that data, using that, you know, the information that we have to show us where to put our dollars, where to put our energy, that's gonna be important. But, um, you know, I think there are some people who will always say that, that the idea of true equity is, um, is, it's beyond ambitious. They'll say it's kind of idealistic. But I, I think that that's what we always have, you know, we say we press toward the mark for the prize. Like we always have to press toward that mark because that's what, a, that's what our society should, that's the promise our society should be making. And so um, that's, that's kind of what we're always working toward. 
Absolutely. Well, I know your phone is dying, and I, um, and it's not going to die on me. So I wanted to um, just say thank you. You know, this was super enlightening for me, and I and I wanted to just let you know, you and and your staff, Live Nation Urban will always be a partner. Whatever you need, if you need a platform or an opportunity to speak, we can absolutely be that partner um, in a different space than than you may usually speak to um, mm -hmm. over the course of your of your run. So. Congratulations again. Good luck. I mean, I don't know if you have anything to say um, in regards to, you, to to running for Congress um, before we leave, if you have enough uh, battery yeah. left. I, I got like 3%. Look, what, what I'll say is, first off, Brandon, thanks so much for having me on Live Nation Urban. I think this is, you know, these are the spaces that we need to fill with thoughtful discourse. Um, earlier today, I got into a little bit of a, a Twitter back and forth with the, the National Republican Campaign Committee because they were saying that I support criminals or something like that. And I was like, this is the problem with our discourse, right? You know, I'm talking about ending cash bail because it criminalizes poverty. And now you say I stand with, with criminals. It's like, no, we really want to have a thoughtful and functional conversation about what it looks like to press toward equity. You know, and for as long as people don't want to have those conversations, we won't make progress as a society. So I, I want to thank you for creating a space for a real conversation. Um, you know, I think that the path forward looks like listening to folks who have different opinions than us, but also bringing folks along. We have a lot of ground to cover. And, uh, and that's what I'm excited to try to do. You know, as I stand in this space, for me, it means really trying to bridge a lot of gaps, trying to have those critical conversations, get into the, the white water where it's really rough and choppy, but at the same time say, hey, we got to have this conversation at this moment in our history, or else we're never going to be the nation of our ambition, you know? And I think that's kind of what, what I'm focused on. But, um, but you know, I, I love the space that you've created and the space that you all are, are allowing me to step into today and, uh, and look forward to keeping in touch. Absolutely. This has honestly been one of the most informative uh, interviews and so no, no, seriously, appreciate it. And I would love to bring you back at a future uh, date because I, you know, this information is so much more I wanted to ask you, but um, I know the kind of time I had. So thank you so much again. Appreciate it, Cameron. Thank Thanks. Y'all take care. Bye. Absolutely. Been another episode of The Souls of Black Folk. I'm your host, Brandon Panky. Panky, tune in next week. Um, appreciate you again, Cameron. Everyone take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.